This is the RightsCast Network, brought to you by Dandelion Web Marketing and the Wisconsin Writers Association, and always streaming at rightscast.net. RightsCast listeners, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Audible. Look, we're all going to be spending a lot of time cooped up at home for the next few weeks, for the next few months. Who knows? The point is this, you're going to need to find some way to pass the time and to keep things fresh, and what better time to start getting familiar with audiobooks than now. That's why I'm encouraging you to head to audibletrial.com slash rightscast, where you can start a free 30-day trial of Audible and get a free audiobook, maybe even Clarabella Ortega's Ghost Squad. Yeah, check that one out. Now's the time to listen to Ghost Squad while you're painting the walls in your home, while you're catching up on all that housework you don't normally have a time to do because you're not there while you're playing, I don't know, on your 3DS or whatever your preferred gaming system might be. You can do all of this while also being immersed in Clarabella Ortega's Ghost Squad if you visit audibletrial.com slash rightscast and get yourself in on that 30-day free trial and a free audiobook today. You can cancel any time, and you can still keep Ghost Squad. Pretty good deal. I think so anyway. The point is this, audibletrial.com slash rightscast, W-R-I-T-E-S-C-A-S-T, audibletrial.com slash rightscast. There's no shying away from it. This is a tough time to launch a book, let alone a debut, but this episode's guest, a champion of all things Twitter, meme, and GIF, is finding ways to ensure her launch goes off without a hitch. And there's so much we can learn from her experience, both in this realm and beyond. Hey there, I'm author, writing coach, and RightsCast Network founder, R.R. Campbell. And welcome to episode 79 of your listener-supported R.R. Campbell RightsCast, here on the RightsCast Network, brought to you by Dandelion Web Marketing and the Wisconsin Writers Association. This episode's guest is Clarabelle Ortega. Clarabelle went from journalism student, editing her classmates' oftentimes hilarious ads and ramblings, to a small-town reporter, where she enjoyed going to Board of Ed meetings and texting the town mayor about the line at Starbucks. Today, she's busy turning her obsession with 80s pop culture, magic, and video games into books. She's the host of the Write or Die podcast and the owner of the small graphic design business Gift Girl and the Gift Girl Shop, which creates apparel for writers and creatives. She lives in New York with her motorcycle riding poet boyfriend and her suspiciously intelligent Yorkie, Pancho Villa. Aside from all of that, Clarabelle is the author of Ghost Squad, which is set to be released on April 7th, 2020 by Scholastic. I was thrilled Clarabelle could join me for this conversation, during which we touch on Ghost Squad, middle grade fiction, grief, and yes, Chunk the Cat. There's plenty of Chunk the Cat. So without further ado, let's get into my full interview of Clarabelle Ortega, author of Ghost Squad. Stay tuned after the episode for updates on what you can expect next from the RightsCast Network, and thanks, as always, for listening. Well, thank you so much, Clarabelle Ortega, for joining me for this episode of the R.R. Campbell RightsCast here on the RightsCast Network. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is a really an interesting time to have a book coming out here, and I want to check in with you, person to person, author to author. How are you holding up with a book launch imminent in these times of self-isolation and social distancing? It's been interesting, uh, to say the least. Um, it's uh, I've been surprisingly very busy because a lot of people have been going out of their way to try and help um, authors who have been affected by the coronavirus um, in terms of their events being uh, canceled. And um, especially, you know, when you're a debut author, this would have been like my first book launch, my first everything. And it's crucial because nobody, you know, knows who I am yet in the in the reading world. So um, I've had a lot of support and people reaching out and people offering to interview me, which is great. Uh, So I've been really busy. It's been strange because I thought I would just sort of like be home and be sort of busy, but like busy, like less busy than usual. But I was really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing um, how how the the landscape shifts, right? <laughs> absolutely, and you know, in the in the beginning, like when before things started to get canceled, it was like a more anxious time for me. I was 
having a hard time with everything because it's almost like all of these things are like looming over your head and you're just waiting for emails of of bad news. But now that all of that is sort of out of the way and I've sort of accepted that I'm going to be at home and doing everything virtually, I've just like accepted it and I'm trying to make the the best of it and have fun with, with it as much as I can. Well, and that's one of the really nice things about this digital age is that there are opportunities to continue to move forward with the book launch and to still be excited and to get readers interested in your work. And I know that you're still holding a digital launch party. Is that right? And then where uh, where will you be facilitating that and how can people tune in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll be have I'll be live streaming a um a digital launch party, a virtual launch party, along with uh, Ryan Lasala, who's the author of Reverie, and Zoraida Cordova, who is the author of the uh, Brooklyn Bruja series, among many other books. Um, it'll be on my YouTube, um, which is just a backslash C backslash Clarabel Ortega author, um, and that's all on all my social medias, and we'll just be live streaming um. An event just like it would be if you went to a bookstore, but uh, on on YouTube. And I'm going to have a menu of food that you can make at home to eat along as you watch the event. Um, we're going to raffle off a, pl- a plush of Chunk, which is the fat cat from my book. <laughs> um, there's going to be, uh, you know, a lot of fun and just hopefully it'll be like f- feel like being at a party when everyone's just sort of like in their living room. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really great that you're finding ways to bring that interactivity to people at home because I know that that's something at book launches that people like to do. I did it at my own first book launch for Accounting for It All. It was like, come to this bar and we'll try and get some drinks together that resemble things the characters in the book might have drank. Well, this won't be happening at a bar, but people at home can make food based yeah. on stuff from the book. So that's that's a really cool way to try and keep up that interactivity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'll be fun. And I'll obviously, you know... W- what everyone has at home differs, <laughs> especially right now. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of like simpler food um, that hopefully people can make. And um, it'll be a lot of options and it, sh- it should be a fun time. I'm excited about it. And just to make sure that we mention it, I'm not sure if we did, that digital release party will be on the book's release date of April 7th, correct? Yes, it will be on April 7th uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, if you want to get the link for anything, it'll be um, for the YouTube. It's on all of my social media. It'll be on my website. You just have to uh, go to clarabellortega.com and I'll have all of the info up about that. So as you have been adapting and getting ready to do this now more digital launch, it seems like you're learning a lot in this process, right? We always learn a lot when we're launching our first book, but is there anything else that you'd like to share maybe with authors who have books coming out in the next month or two after yours who maybe need to start doing this kind of planning? What, What can you kind of pass along to them in terms of advice? Um, so I would definitely say to try to think outside the box of what you normally would and don't downplay something because it's not the traditional way that it's normally done in terms of launches. Like I've seen people sort of like not make a big, as big of a deal about announcing their launch because it's going to be digital, but I would say, don't do that. I would say make as big of a deal as you would, uh, make a graphic, have someone make a graphic for you. Um, if your publisher is not making it, try to find guests to do it with, um, try to find ways for the audience to, um, interact with you because people really love that. People really love a chance to be able to interact and ask questions and maybe win something, um, the, and um, one thing, really cool thing that my publisher did for me was that they secured Books of Wonder as like the official bookseller for my launch. So even though it, because I was supposed to have my launch at Books of Wonder. So even though um, it won't be in a bookstore, um, Books of Wonder is still the official bookstore where people can pick up Ghost Squad. And they um, partnered with us so that they amplified the launch and shared it on all of their social media, which is a really great way not only to to support indie bookstores, which we really should be doing right now, but also um, to get the word out and to a wider audience. Yeah, there's really something to be said for how much it seems artists everywhere between indie bookstores and those of us who are out there just creating are in this stage of trying to cultivate community and keep everyone's 
hopes up, keep the energy up. And there really is, like you say, something so critical about remaining excited about Mm -hmm. our work and about our creativity and about what it is that we have to look forward to during these times. So I'm really glad that you have made sure listeners can walk away with that, whether they are someone who is just writing from the comfort of their own home, or they do have a book, in fact, coming out in the next couple of months. Yeah, absolutely. And people really do feed off of your energy and they reflect the the energy that you put out um, about certain things. So if they see you not excited about it, um, which I don't I, – I honestly, I understand if someone is having a hard time being excited. I get it. You know, I also don't want people to force themselves to feel something that they don't. Sometimes – people just need to to heal <laughs> and that is okay too and i get that um but if you can and if you have it in you to to find excitement for it um i feel like for me it helped me to to feel better um finding that excitement that little sort of spark of maybe this could be fun helped me to heal from the disappointment of having to cancel all of these first time huge uh events for me um so, so yeah, I think that people definitely will will see th- your reaction to it and they'll respond to it um, accordingly. And that's just how the internet works, you know, that's just how social media works. Um, so if you can find a way or even like have a friend do it for you, like if you, if, if you know, you'll be okay for the day of the actual launch, but you can't muster like uh, the excited tweet right now, have a friend draft it for you and send it out for you, you know? Yeah, there are certainly ways to continue to stay in touch. Again, thank you to this digital age. And of course, keeping excitement in the spotlight here. Let's talk about the book we are going to be excited about. And that is, of course, Ghost Squad. So Clarabelle, why don't you let listeners know what is Ghost Squad all about? Um, so Ghost Squad is the story of 12-year-old Luceli Luna, who lives in St. Augustine with her father, Simon, who runs a ghost tour called the Luna Ghost Tour. And um, they are, you know, not doing too well financially. And um, on top of that, Luceli sort of lives in a haunted house because her <laughs> the ancestors of her relatives live in this giant tree in her backyard. Um, and they live on as both ghosts and fireflies. So they sort of shift between the two. Um, one day, the firefly ghost of her grandmother um, becomes unresponsive, and in an effort to help her, Luceli and her best friend Sid find this um, spell in a graveyard, which I don't recommend. And <laughs> they, um, when they incite the spell, they wake up these evil spirits, and they have to then team up with Sid's witchy grandmother Babette and with uh, Babette's fat cat chunk to try to send the evil spirits back into the underworld before all of St. Augustine is dragged down there with them. And the moral of the story there is just say no to spells in graveyard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what is it? I know that you're writing in the middle grade space and I kind of want to explore for listeners who are tuning in, who are authors themselves or who are maybe new to writing or just unfamiliar with the term. Clarabelle, could you explain for them what middle grade fiction is? How do, how do we categorize that? So middle grade fiction is fiction that's for children from about 8 to 12 years old, usually. And it's just dealing with themes of sort of um, belonging and finding your place in the world. And um, there's a lot of like family and friendship. And it's just geared towards uh, children of that age. Uh, The humor is my kind of humor. There's a lot of fart jokes and um, fun stuff like that. And it's just it's just really my favorite to write. I love middle grade so much. What is it that drew you to writing in middle grade in the first place? What was your personal journey like for getting into that space? I, you know, I never thought that I would be good at writing middle grade. A friend suggested that, um, that I should try it because of uh, my voice when I write. And, and when I, when I started to, to give it a shot, I realized like, this is my, this is my comfort zone. Like, like middle grade, it comes very, very natural to me. Um, I think just like my writing voice is, is well suited for it. And, um, it just took like the suggestion of a friend basically, um, to, to give it a shot because I, I also write young adult and I had been writing exclusively young adult books until 
um, they suggested I should try middle grade. And now I can't stop writing middle grade. <laughs> <laughs> you, have found, you have found your lane, so to speak. Yes, you found yes. your calling in that way. <laughs> yes. And I'm curious for other writers who may be trying to figure out, okay, am I more suited for young adult? Am I suited for writing adult? Am I suited for middle grade? In your experience writing middle grade, what can other writers who want to write in that category do to make sure they are meeting a middle grade audience where they're at? Is there anything you kept in mind while doing uh, your writing? Um, so I think that the most important thing to to do if you want to develop a strong voice or know what it is that a good middle grade uh, voice or book uh, sounds and looks like is to read a lot of middle grade. Um, read a lot of middle grade, um, recent middle grade as well, because – as time goes on, you know, the voice for different kinds of books do change. Um, so read a lot of uh, recent middle grade and just um, I would say that that's the best tool that I had for making sure that the that it sounded like an actual kid. Um, also, a very helpful thing is if you have children in your life who are around that age, let them read it and let them tear you to shreds because they will. And they will, um, they'll let you know if you're doing a good job of capturing uh, what they really sound and feel like. Here we are again, another episode brought to you by the wonderful folks of Dandelion Web Marketing. Dandelion Web Marketing is going to help you. Yes, you a writer tuning into this program, they're going to help you build a thriving author platform through strategic web marketing. So if you're not sure if you're on the right track with your website, you can get one of their author website audits and find out. Listeners to this show right now can receive 50, 50% off one of these amazing author website audits, which will look at your site's content, security, design, search engine optimization, and more. And it'll also provide you with some insight on what you might do to improve the connection you strive to make with your audience. So to learn more about the strengths and weaknesses of your current website and save 50% along the way, you can visit dandelionwebmarketing.com slash rightscast to learn more. That's dandelionwebmarketing.com slash rightscast. When it comes to recommending that writers read middle grade, let's say maybe they don't have kids that, that age in their life that they can reach out to, are there any authors that you found particularly instructive when going through your own reading of the category before writing Ghost Squad or while you wrote Ghost Squad? Um, so I have a, a few recommendations for that. One of them would be uh, Jessica Townsend's um, Nevermore uh, series. I, I'm not sure if that's the name of the series. That's definitely the name of the first book. Um, I, it's called actually The Trials of Morgan Crow, I believe. But um, that series is fantastic. The voice is really good. It is reminiscent of a Harry Potter, but I would say that it's a lot more modernized. And um, the voice there is fantastic. Um, I would always say, also say Karen Strong with Just South of Home and Daniel Jose Older with the Doctor Hill Squad. Very good. So those are some good places that listeners can get started or can expand their taste into the world of middle grade uh the, of middle grade fiction, I should say. So let's focus again now on Ghost Squad specifically and explore what it is that led you to want to write this book. What what was the inspiration for Ghost Squad for you? So Ghost Squad was mainly inspired by um, this game that I used to play with my brother and the folklore that was attached to it that I didn't realize was attached to it. So when um, my brother passed away um, a few years ago from cancer and um, his, his uh, passing actually really inspired my entire writing career. And one of the things that we love to do as children is to catch fireflies in mason jars and then let them go, obviously. But um, we love to do that. And it wasn't until that I, I was uh, a little bit older that I learned that we have a folklore in Dominican Republic that says that fireflies are actually the spirits of our um, lost loved ones who are watching over us. And I just thought that was a really beautiful um sort of message uh, from, you know, my brother. <laughs> and uh, I thought it would be great to to put that in a book and to put that in a book in order to open up the conversation about grief in a way that wasn't um, so pointed. So a child reads the book and, 
you know, the first thing that they're probably going to to do is identify the fact that if they had firefly spirits, who would they be, right? And um, that can be a sad thought to think about, but I feel like um, the conversations around death and loss are really important to have early on. Um, it's a, such a it's a natural part of of our lives, right? Um, so, really, um, I would say it's twofold. It was inspired both by my brother Pablo and also by um, my Dominican folklore. And um, yeah, that's really what drove me to write the story. That really is inspiring for a few reasons. Of course, because to some extent, it comes from that well of writing what you know, which I know is some of that common writing advice that gets bandied about and people interpret it one way, some people interpret it another, but it's really wonderful that everything was able to come full circle for you and you were able to embrace this folklore while also embracing this spirit of something that was so personal to both you and to your brother Pablo when you were younger. And as someone here who is now writing a manuscript that is very personal and it's one that I have been putting off dipping my toes into the water for for years since my father's passing, I am finding it to be very cathartic to get that particular story Mm -hmm. down. And Clarabelle, for you, when you first sat down to write Ghost Squad or what Ghost Squad would become, what was your headspace kind of like? Did you find that it also provided a similar catharsis or was uh, what was that like for you? Absolutely. Um, There were times where it was really helpful and it was comforting. And the reason why it's comforting is because the whole idea behind Ghost Squad is that the people who leave us never really leave, right? It's, 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 it's in a more um, sort of tangible way with Luceli and her firefly spirits. But um, the message and the story is that they're still around us. They're still in the things that we experience with them. They're still in our hearts. And writing about that and trying to convey that um, comforted me <laughs> um, because I am also dealing with grief and loss. And um, there were also times when it was hard to write, um, when it was difficult because you're writing about this deeply personal thing. But I got a lot of feelings and emotions out as I was writing it for sure. And it it definitely was cathartic. Is that something that maybe you would encourage other writers to consider doing is perhaps once in a while, and of course, when they're ready, really exploring some of these uh, more challenging things that they might have going on in their life? And if so, is there something that you did in your approach to the page that they might be able to learn from? Um, so I think that that's a you know obviously a deeply personal decision to make because it can be def- it can be hard and the one thing that you have to remember is when you write a book about something so personal if it ends up being published you have to continue talking about those things um, so you have to make sure that you're okay with that and that can be difficult and it, it, especially if it's a fresher um, loss if it's something that just happened recently. Um, so I would say definitely it can be helpful if, if even if it's something that you write only for yourself um, and if you feel the, the the calling or the urge to write about it because you feel like it would help others then and and you feel okay doing it, then I would definitely encourage it. Um, it can definitely be really nice. I've 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 been at events where I've talked about the inspiration behind Ghost Squad and I've had people come up to me afterwards thanking me for talking about it because they experienced loss as well. And it was nice to hear someone talk about it so openly. And that can be really, um, it can be a healing moment for you because it can make you realize that even though this terrible thing happened, good things can still come of it. And that's really been my experience with Ghost Squad for sure. Um, and in terms of my approach, I I would say I, I didn't have a specific one in terms of, you know, the the subject matter, but I, ju- I made sure that I let myself take breaks when I needed to because of how hard it was at times. Right. And I think that one of the great takeaways there and something that's resonating with me in particular is this idea that when you do start opening up and of course being prepared to have to or to be opening up more if your book does get published and you're in the position that you are in is that once you do open up at some of these public events and people do seem to come forward in the same way that I know back in episode 66 of this show, listeners might remember that Greg Rents came forward to talk about his experience as a fire captain in Milwaukee and what it was like to write about that given the inherent danger that plagues that 
entire occupation on a day to day basis. And that got me opening up more and more about some of my own experiences. And I have found, as I know Greg has found, and it seems you too, Clarabelle, have found, is that people will come forward and they will be thankful. And there will be this really great moment where we can remind ourselves that we are not alone in our grief and we never really do lose our loved ones. Just like in Ghost Squad, sure, they're around in terms of fireflies, but there are so many ways that we can capture having this feeling of fireflies around us. And perhaps some of these smaller interpersonal moments are a great way to capture that on the back end of having written something like you've written. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I think that any chance that we can get it to connect to one another as human beings and to teach each other um, that you can get through something, we should take it if, if if you can and if you're okay doing it. Like I always try to emphasize that because it can be really difficult to to, to write about these things and to s- express these things in a way that um, you feel comfortable with and, and not everyone is okay sort of um, exposing that, that, really super vulnerable part of themselves. Um, but for me, I find that what the more vulnerable I am in my writing, um, the better it tends to be. And I'm increasingly finding that more and more for myself. So you have two voices here, listeners, who are, who are doubling <laughs> down on that point. It's okay. You know, just do that writing when you're comfortable with it. And like Clarabelle says, take those breaks when you need them. So let's pivot a little bit more to focus on connection, right? Because as we talked about at the top of this episode, you're moving, of course, to a digital book launch. But the wonderful thing about a book launch is that there's never just one event. You've been promoting this book for a while now. And I know Mm -hmm. that not that long ago, you had an opportunity to do a school visit and talk to high schoolers about Ghost Squad. What was it like to be in that kind of environment and to connect with those students? It was really great. It was super fun. Um, so I had a whole presentation for them and it was full of memes, of course, because that's <laughs> just what I do. Every time I do something, I try to make sure it's fun for me as well. <laughs> and um, and it was amazing. I mean, I, I wasn't sure how they would react because obviously Go Squad is for younger kids. Um, but I was mostly talking about my journey as an author. So um, I was talking to the – it was a – It was an event put on by the National Honor Society of the high school that I went to. Um, So it was all kids who are interested in writing and interested in the English language. And um, they had so many questions, so many more than I thought they would. Like, we didn't have time um, to answer all of them. And it was a really nice experience. It was really great. It was my first, like, official Ghost Squad school visit. So it, it was a fantastic time and it was really nice to just be able to see their reactions of seeing, telling them how long publishing takes and seeing them <laughs> react to the timeline right. um, and all the setbacks that could happen um, and that did happen to me. <laughs> and, um, and it was fantastic. And we just talked about writing and video games and all sorts of stuff. It was really great. Were there any questions from those that you were able to take in the time that you had available that really stood out to you? And if so, how did you how did you respond? Um, I don't know if there were any questions that really stood out. Um, to be quite honest, I have a really bad memory, so I don't remember most of the questions now. Um, I do know that a girl came up to me after and um, she... Ha- was clear, very clearly struggling with some sort of loss in her life as well. And she was trying to hold back tears and she just thanked me for talking about everything and just like said, sorry for your loss. And it was just really sweet to see um, that and to see that I had touched her in some way. Um, It was nice for her to, you know, thank me uh, for talking about it because it's it's sometimes not easy. Um, so that really stayed with me for sure. And, um, and then there was another, um, teen who I, they asked me what my favorite video games were. And one of them is kingdom hearts and she nearly screamed and I didn't realize it, but she had a kingdom hearts t-shirt on. So So she was like, when she came up to me, she was like losing it. She was so excited. Um, so that was great. This episode of the R.R. Campbell Writes Cast is also brought to you by the Wisconsin Writers Association and their Jade Ring Contest. The Jade Ring Contest is in its 72nd year, and they are looking for your submissions. They want your poetry. They want your nonfiction. They want your fiction. 
And by submitting your work, you'll have the chance to see it published in Wisconsin People and Ideas magazine, as well as Creative Wisconsin Literary Journal. There are also cash prizes in play, as well as the coveted jade ring itself. So if you are sitting on a piece of fiction, shorter than 2,000 words in length. If you are sitting on a piece of nonfiction shorter than 2,000 words in length, or if you're sitting on a small trove of poems, now is the time to submit them at wiwrite.org slash contest for consideration in this year's Jade Ring. Again, the place to visit on the web to learn more about eligibility and the full details of the annual contest is wiwrite.org slash contest. And that's all really the fun side of it too there, right? Of course, we've talked a fair amount in this conversation about some of the broader thematic elements of Ghost Squad and what it is that we want our readers to walk away from in terms of lessons about grief, et cetera. But there's this really fun element to getting out and speaking with readers. And there's a really fun element, of course, I'm sure there are many to your book, but I'm thinking specifically, of course, about Chunk the Cat. <laughs> <laughs> to become a bit of a phenomenon online. So, Clarabelle, what role does Chunk play in the story for those who may not be familiar? <laughs> so, Chunk the cat. So, um, Chunk is uh, is belongs to Babette, who is Sid's uh, grandmother, and Babette is a witch. And I said, well, she's a witch. I have to give her cats, right? And I gave her eight cats, and each of the cats is named after one of the Goonies. Um, but the main cat who is sort of Babette's uh, familiar in a way and sticks around a lot and sort of keeps an eye out for her on behalf of Babette um, is Chunk. And um, Chunk is a really fat uh, tabby, and she loves string cheese. <laughs> and she's along for a lot of the adventure uh, with the girls, sometimes um, – not because they want her to come along. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, she's an interesting character. There's definitely more to her than what we see sort of in on the cover or in the descriptions that have come out thus far. Um, so you'll have to read the book to to learn more about that. <laughs> And I believe, in fact, that we had a voicemail come in here from someone who I presume has read the book. So, Clarabelle, I'm going to play the voicemail for you, and sure. uh, we will see what it is you have to say by way of reply. This is uh, from Brian in New York. Sure. Hello, my name is Brian, and I'm from New York. This question is for Clarabelle Ortega about her upcoming release, of Ghost Squad. I was really fascinated by the inclusion of Chunk the Cat. I think she's fabulous. And I was wondering about your creative choice to not give her the lead role, since she is clearly the most beautiful and talented character in the book. Please let me know. Thank you. <laughs> so here we have it. Of course, a call dedicated to Chunk. <laughs> to Chunk. So thank you for that call at 608-284-8342. If you are someone who has a question for a future guest, you can call in at that number. But Clarabelle, let's get to the matter at hand. What do you have to say to this caller? What What's the deal? Um, so I didn't quite hear the last part of his question. Um yeah, he was focusing on why is it that Chunk isn't the lead character? Chunk is clearly <laughs> the most talented and beautiful of all characters. Well, Chunk, uh, it would be difficult for uh, the book to be interesting if we just followed Chunk <laughs> around and her just saying meow for like 265 pages, which is mostly what she says. Um she did get her own cover, though, for the Scholastic Book Fair a version of the book. So there's that. <laughs> we're all Yes, we're all about uh, paying our dues to Chunk. We need to make sure that Chunk is respected as much as possible. And I don't know, we'll save the uh, Chunk being the lead character for the annals of fan fiction, perhaps. So that's something that our caller can perhaps consider taking up. But we did have one other caller here for you, Clara Bell. They do have a uh, part of their question, yes, is about Chunk, but they do have a question <laughs> a little bit about process as well. So I will go ahead and play this voicemail for us now. Sure. Hi, I my name is Kat from New York, and this question is for Clarabelle Ortega, author of Ghost Squad. And I want to ask her that when she's writing paranormal fiction or contemporary fantasy, what does she think about first, the contemporary world or the magical aspects of the world? And then I also want to know how she comes up with such funny and interesting side characters like Chunk the Cat or like the cool grandma in Good Squad. Um, they're really, really funny. So I just really want to know how she comes up with those characters. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So there we have it again. Another question about Chunk, a question about the grandma at 608-284-8342. So we've, we've spoken a little bit about Chunk. So let's maybe start with the first half of the question. When you're writing or when you're approaching your work, do you find yourself thinking about the contemporary elements or the magic first? And how does that play into your process overall? Um, I definitely think about the magic part of it first, although you know, the contemporary elements are folded in within that. So it comes very quickly after how the, you know, the normal world reacts to it or what they know and don't know. But I mostly focus on the magic first, because that's the part of the book that's going to be taking up the most space and time. Um, And in terms of how I come up with side characters, I honestly don't know. (laughs) It's they just sort of come to me. <laughs> the background of Kingdom Hearts and gifts, <laughs> and memes, right? It's it's all out there for us, and and the Goonies too, like you say, you yeah, the Goonies. <laughs> I I mean, I really I really do love sort of like um, ensemble casts when it comes to movies and like um, and video games and all those things. I grew up with that kind of um, media. So I think it's just like part of like deep down in like my like little Clarabelle's brain, like a thing that I always really liked. And it's just sort of been like fermenting all these years. (laughs) It's funny how it just percolates to the top in those strange moments of inspiration that we didn't expect. And suddenly we have Chunk the Cat. Suddenly we have this incredible, interesting grandmother character as well. So very cool. Thank you, Kat, for that call. Again, listeners in the future, if you have questions for other guests, you can get a hold of us at 608-284-8342. So Clarabelle, as we wrap up our conversation here, I think it is important that we remind listeners, where is it that they can find you online and how can they order your book? Sure. Um, so I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Clarabelle underscore Ortega. And you can buy my book, Ghost Squad, at buyghostsquad.com. I made it very easy for you. There is our links to all of the different um, stores and websites where Ghost Squad is available. If you want a signed copy, I am um, – I'm partnered up with two indie stores, Word Up Books and Split Rock Books to do that. Um, And that's on buygosquad.com as well. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Clarabelle Ortega. The book, listeners, is Ghost Squad. Clarabelle, thank you again for joining me for this episode. Thank you so much for having me. It was a a lot of fun. That's all for my conversation with Clarabelle Ortega, author of Ghost Squad. Thanks to Clarabelle for coming on the show. And thanks to you, dear listeners, for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you could leave the RightsCast Network a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. This will help the RightsCast Network reach more writers like you, and building that sense of community is what we, and I hope you, are all about. To those of you who have already left us a rating and review, thank you. I'd also like to thank the RightsCast Network's patrons, who contribute to our programming financially at patreon.com slash rightscast. In exchange for their support, RightsCast Network patrons get access to some great patron perks, including RightsCast swag, discounts on my editing services, and entries in monthly drawings for partial manuscript critiques performed by yours truly. And have I mentioned we now have new patron tiers and perks available? We do! So if ever there was a time to consider showing your support for our community, this is it, and you can check it out at patreon.com slash rightscast. When you visit our Patreon community, you'll be joining patrons like Laura Hazen and Angeline Boley in supporting our programming directly at $1, 2 or $3 per episode or per month. Any level of contribution will get you access to those fantastic patron perks I mentioned earlier, so go ahead and visit patreon.com slash rightscast. That's patreon.com slash rightscast. Thanks as well to our on-air sponsors, Dandelion Web Marketing and the Wisconsin Writers Association. To learn more about them or our other sponsors, you can visit rightscast.net slash sponsors. Coming up next on the RightsCast Network is an episode of Novel Approaches, featuring yours truly and guest co-host Avery Ames. In that episode, we'll be tackling the ins and outs of writing retellings, so be sure to tune in on April 10th when that episode debuts on Apple Podcasts, rightscast.net, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Until then, you can stay in touch with us by visiting rightscast.net or by saying hello on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at RightsCast or by searching for the RightsCast Network. 
We're also available by email at rightscast at gmail.com, and you can now call us at area code 608-284-8342, where you can leave a voicemail with questions for future guests or other matters you'd like us to address in our programming. Again, that number is 608-284-8342. To reach me personally, you can visit rrcampbellwrites.com or holler at me on Twitter, where I can be found as at I am R.R. Campbell. I love hearing from listeners of all backgrounds, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this is R.R. Campbell signing off. Write on and write well. This is the RightsCast Network, brought to you by Dandelion Web Marketing and the Wisconsin Writers Association, and always streaming at rightscast.net.